We're going to be talking a lot about alcohol today because that is my business. But we're not going to be talking about drinking. We're going to talk about the business side. So whether you're 21 or under 21, it doesn't matter. This subject matter applies for everyone. I will say I'm pretty proud to be here. I am a 1990 graduate of Southern Illinois University of Edmondsville. Um, my girlfriend at the time followed me over here, and ultimately we got married. So that's my wife, Amy. And then now my daughter, Kat, back there at the back, she goes here. So a little bit of a legacy at this point. So we got a whole SIUE thing going on. So very pleased to be here tonight. So I do own a company called the ABV Network, which is a multimedia corporation. It's a very small company. And uh, I'm going to tell you guys a little bit, you know, kind of all the details, how it got going and all that. It really, you know, as I sat in rooms like this, like you guys are doing right now at your age, you know, you don't necessarily know what you want to do. You know, especially if you're doing like me, I was a business major, you know, things aren't def defined. I, I didn't sit there and think, you know, I'm going to own a podcast company at some point. They weren't even invented yet. So, you know, you, you kind of, you know, bump through things in life. And But I, I want to help you guys maybe lay a you know, good foundation for the future with some of the things that I'm talking about. And also, it's a story of perseverance. You know, things that, uh, you know, you get thrown some curveballs along the way. Uh, when you're going through your career, and I, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that happened with me, and you know what uh, what I've done to get past those. So just a little bit more about my company before we get into the uh, you know the logistics of, of everything. Uh, I will say too, it's very informal. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to jump in at any time. And uh, you know I'm sure we'll save room at the end too for you know full Q and A session. But you know anytime you're going to talk, just throw your hands up and jump in. I don't mind that at all. Uh, so the the company that I run. It's kind of a three-pronged company at this point. So uh, Matt mentioned the, uh, the uh, podcast, and I think that's kind of the biggest thing that we do. It uh, certainly has the largest audience, and uh, we, we have uh, the ABB Network does stand for Alcohol by Volume. So all of our all of our podcasts are alcohol themed. So we've got uh, we've got a beer podcast. We've got uh, uh, we're going to have a, a woman's you know bourbon show uh, called the Bourbon Bendies, and then we've also got two very popular bourbon podcasts. One called the Bourbon Show and one called the Bourbon Daily. So bourbon's really a big focus of what we do. So the Bourbon Show, what we do with that is we interview individuals from the uh, you know, industry, the world of bourbon. So we talk to a lot of different people, key people who work, you know, we talk to Julian Van Winkle, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Patrick Van Winkle, that's a big bourbon. You know, all different types of bourbon companies. We interview the master distillers or the owners of the company. Then we do one that is called the Bourbon Daily, and that's more along the lines of lighthearted and fun. What do you find kind of with a typical morning radio show, probably? You know, we don't take things too seriously. We do have a topic each day, but again, it's very singular. We're only going to talk about one topic. We might, you know, do a day on how to, you know, host a tasting party, or we might go through the lineup of one of the bourbon companies and talk about all their products. It's going to be something different every day, and it's going to be very short, usually about 20 minutes. Sometimes if we have a guest on, it could go as long as an hour, but I'd say the average for that show is about 30 minutes a day that we do. Uh, the other thing Matt also mentioned too, I do a newsletter called Bourbon Zeppelin. Again, pretty popular within the industry. Uh, if you're interested in that, you certainly can sign up. It's free, so it's just an email thing that we send out twice a month now on the 1st and 15th of every month. And again, it's, uh, we have about 20 staff writers, so it's a pretty big publication in terms of you know, what, uh, what's happening in the industry and that type of thing. And then the other thing I do is I write. I'm an author, and I've probably got about 50 different you know, items in my catalog at this point. So that is about 20 published books, some short stories, and uh, then I've kind of deconstructed some of the books, too, and have some of the individual chapters and that type of thing. And we'll talk about all those type of things uh, as, as we go through in my career and my life and, and you know, how I got to the point where I'm at right now. You know, a lot of this uh, all comes back to one point, though. Uh, how you, you really can be successful, no matter what your career path is, is to be smart with your money. That's one of the things that definitely helped me out. The fact that you know I always lived beneath my means. You know my wife Amy and I, uh, you know never spent all the money. We always you know maxed out our, our four hundred one k, and then when we get a raise, we probably split that. So say you got a four percent raise from your office, well, we we put another two percent into our four hundred one k the next year, and then uh, just take a two percent raise. So you are getting a raise every year, but you're also raising the amount that you have. Future. And that certainly can help out. That's going to play a big factor down the road when I get to you about <coughs> starting the podcast company. You know, other things that you can do, you know, zero credit card debt, that's that's important. You know, cars, you know, seem like they're, they're flashy. And, you know, of course, when you graduate, you, you get a job, you finally got some money, you might want to get a flashy car. It's better to get something that's either used or, or something that you're going to hold on to a long time. And, uh, you know, um, I, I think you know doing a combination of all those things is really going to help you out. So that's that's one of the things 
that really helped me to get to where I'm at. But, you know, to, to be smart with my money. It's kind of your ticket to freedom, if you will. Because if you've got money, you have the ability to take something and, and follow your passion. So there might be times when you get out of college and you, know, you get married and you, you have kids, and then you have kids in college. There's a lot of times when you have expenses. Maybe you're not doing exactly what you want to do. But you know, in the back of your mind, when you get past those things, you might be able to chase your passion. And that's kind of what I'm doing at this point. So that was kind of my, my ultimate goal. There was a little bump in that in my plan, and we'll talk about that as we get to that point. But uh, that was ultimately what, what I did. I worked at a corporate job, wasn't real happy with it probably the last half of my time there. Uh, but you know, it, it, it paid bills, it, it taught me a lot of things that I was able to learn about business and things like that. So, so you know, those, those sort of things you know, can't help as you set along the path of what you really want to do. I will say, starting out, uh, you know, when I, when I just got started with this, and you could say, what, when did you get on this path that you're on now? I would say it probably goes all the way back to third grade. In third grade, we had an assignment that was write a one-page adventure story. And I came up with this idea for this, these two boys, Frank and Dirk. And uh, it was, I called it The Legend of Bear Island. And I came up with this whole story in my mind of how these boys wanted to go to this mysterious island that was a little bit off of the coast of where they live. They'd have to take a canoe there. And uh, you know they would get in this big adventure with this uh, mystical bear that was supposedly on there and, and you know, get in the, you know, ultimately take it down and become heroes. And uh, it was just a one-page story, though. So again, I'm a third grader. I start writing it, setting up character development and all that stuff. I get to the end. I, you know, I get them, they're in the, in the water, you know, they're paddling out towards the, the Bear Island. And uh, the, they're, you know, they're having all kinds of problems. The boat's rocking. Finally, it crashes on there. And uh, Dirk says, Frank, Frank, I think we're on Bear Island. When they wake up, they're going to come pass up. And I was so bummed because I didn't get to the rest of the story. I didn't get to the fight with the bear or anything like that. I was very upset. I, you know, so I went to my mom, and she had me read the story. And she said, no, this is a great story. You're leaving for the reader, you know, what's going to happen with those boys. Are they going to find the bear? Are they not going to find the bear? You know, what you have, and even with that just one page, is, is really good. I, I disagreed with it. I thought it was just, you know, a mom telling her son, you know, so he's doing a good job. So, you know, but I took it and, and took it into my class and read it and, you know, got a standing ovation. From the class when I read that story, and I really put an act on it and read it. And I, I, at that point forward, I knew I wanted to be a writer. So in third grade, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And as I researched it, I really liked the concept, the fact that it's unlimited what you make. There's no cap on what a writer makes. It depends on how many you know, books it you sell. I also like the fact, too, that you do the work up front, and then you collect the money, the royalties. So you write a book. You might write a book this year. Three years from now, you're still collecting money from the work that you did three years ago. So it was just something that I wanted to do. But as I got further along in school and, and time, you know, got away from that, I thought, well, that's a that's a hard gig though because there's no set path. How do you become a writer? We just start writing, and hopefully someone notices it. And ultimately, that's not what I decided I was going to do. I, I still wanted to do something very creative. So uh, upon my completion of my graduation from uh, SIUE again in 1990, I decided to go out and start looking for a job. And what, what I landed on was, because I had a business administration degree, emphasis in management and marketing, I decided I wanted to be in the marketing, doing something good. So I, I, you know, I applied at some different places. The, uh, the ad agency that was doing the Anheuser-Busch ads at the time, of course, Anheuser-Busch is still big today. At that time, even a bigger presence, you know, not so many craft breweries. Very, you know, growing. You know, they hadn't been sold out yet, so it was a St. Louis only based company, and uh, you know, to, to do ads for them and, and that type of thing. So I interviewed for that job, got the job, but the offer was seventeen thousand dollars. That's almost laughable now, I guess, but that was full time work. But that was low back then. Even. I was making twenty four thousand dollars working part time in a grocery store, so I get an idea how how um, you know low that pay was, and I turned it down. And then, so what do you do at that point? So again, I worked in a grocery store. I kind of fell back on, you know, what, what could you do that where you could make some decent money? And, and, and you know, I, I just couldn't get into the creator side. I tried some other places and I found that that was going to be at the entry level. They were going to almost, it's almost like a paid internship. And you'll do that for a year or two. And, you know, looking back, I probably should have done that. I was at a point in my life when I could have done that, but I was too proud because uh, I was making more than that working part time in the grocery store. So. What I ultimately did is I went to work for a food broker selling groceries, and you know, very successful at that. Worked for a small company that bought out a couple other companies were doing very well, and then what happened? They got bought out, and the company that bought them out they overextended themselves in buying us out. Ultimately, went out of business. So you know, I had to look for a different job. 
I landed uh, a, a large corporation in St. Louis. So uh, the, you know, Unigroup, which is a, uh, a parent company of United Airlines and Mayflower Transit. So the, you know, I was in the moving business. So what I did for them, I did, went to work uh, in sales. It was a corporate job, so what I did is I called on companies saying, uh, if they were moving their people, we'd get contracts with them. And I did that about five years. And at that point, then I moved on to a different job. I transitioned to a product manager job. Now in that job, what I did was, I trained salespeople, I uh, did some social media things, I, I did a little bit of everything, I, I, you know, but I took a different approach than anybody ever, ever had done with that before. I decided to have some fun with it. I wrote newsletters, and I would interview salespeople, what makes them successful, and it always had a funny slant to it. Uh, something very different, it had a very corporate feel to the job, but I was having some fun with it. And then we, were doing, we would do a lot of training over uh, webinars. And again, same thing, I treated it like it was a, a show. And ultimately, as I look back now, I'm doing these podcasts. The training that I was doing was really like I'm doing now on, on my podcast. Really having some fun and, and making people interested in what I was doing. Uh, they ended up liking it a lot more, and we were very successful. So we turned down something where we used to um, be a, a lost leader for the company. We, you know, if the, the training division would cost us. We started charging for our training because the the, uh, the salespeople liked it so much. They were willing to pay for it, and ended up we ended up you know making money on it before I left the organization. So that was, that was interesting. Um, but what really kind of spurred me on to get to the point where I'm at now, on December 12, 2012, um, I had lunch with my dad. He, uh, he used to come up to uh, work with me and uh, we'd go out to lunch once a week. Fun time, had lunch with him, um, was in a meeting at the end of the day and I got a phone call and said, uh, you know, something's wrong with dad. So I, I you know, rode to the hospital and ultimately he didn't make it. You know, really a, a sad thing, and, and I, you know, always in the back of my mind, I thought I wanted to be a writer, and I just kept putting it off, putting it off. So here's a situation where, you know, my dad, uh, I have lunch with him, and you know, 18 hours later, I'm in a, a funeral home picking out a casket for him. And I thought, you know, that, you know, it, whatever happens in life, it can end in a split second. You have to chase your dreams. So what I did is I started writing, and. Uh, you know, it was kind of crazy to think that, uh, you know, you could just start writing like that. But I did. And I wrote a lot. So, uh, wait till you hear about all these things I wrote. So the first one I did, you have to think, this was right after my dad passed away in early 2013. So again, he just died in December of 2012. In early 2013, I was on this path and I wanted to start writing. So, what do you write about? I didn't really have a plan. Again, I because I just kind of picked this up when my dad passed away. So it wasn't like I had the special weather, here's what I'm gonna write about. And uh, what I decided to write about was, and this is a weird one, the 101 best Christmas songs. And the reason why I did that was, there was nothing that was normal in life at that point. My mom, of course, was still around. She's still here today. Um, and, but, you know, when I go over to her house, she loved Christmas music. When I was a kid, that's something that she always, you know, drug out the Christmas songs and things like that, the records at, uh, at Christmas time. And it was something that was very important to her. And I thought, you know what, if I wrote a book that just had 101 different Christmas songs and then up to three options, you know, which are the best ones? Again, it's very subjective, but again, it's my book, I'm writing it, I can, I can do whatever I want. So my mom and I worked on that. And then something that felt normal at that time, because my mom liked it, you know, we, we'd sit there and have these debates on, you know, what good, because there's really, literally at that point, nothing else was normal. You'd say, well, you know, go out to eat or do something. Anything you think about, you know, it, you, my, the presence of my dad was there. You know, he, you know, I would think about, you know, if you, if you go out to dinner or watch football games, you're big into football, any of those type of things, you start thinking about that. But when my mom and I worked on that book, things seemed very different. So the book got published, uh, again, all self-published, everything that I'm talking about, I, I published myself, which uh, the, the way self-publishing is today, it's very simple. It, uh, it allows you to, you know, it really mirrors what, uh, what a traditional publishing is like, because you can buy it in your local bookstore, you can buy it through Amazon, so it, it, it's very similar to what would happen if it was a you know, traditional uh, publishing route. But um, when, I, when I did that, I, you know, I did all the right things. I read books on you know, how to market the book once you publish it or what. Spent some money in uh, doing press releases, and sent enough books to, to review and things like that. And what happened was nobody bought it. So I wrote another book. The second book that I wrote was called Life of Eggster. My dad's nickname was Eggster. I wrote a biography on my dad. And you know, I just thought it'd be cool because the, the fact that, that here's a guy who's not famous, he never did, he never was on TV or anything like that. But here's a guy you, you have the ability to read a book about him, and it was half about his life 
and then have all these funny stories. Because all of my dad had all these shenanigans, all kinds of crazy stuff would happen to him. So it was half that. Literally, no one has bought that, but I'll always have that in my catalog because I'm very proud of the fact that I have a biography about my dad out there, somebody I care about very much. Third book, I just got the idea one time I had a cup of coffee out, with my cat started to take a drink out of it, and I thought, man, what if there's a coffee drinking cat? Could you do an adventure? So I wrote a children's book on Leo the coffee drinking cat. And again, same thing, nothing hit. Nobody was buying any of my books. Then I thought, well, you kind of maybe, I knew the grocery business. I'd worked so long, both working at a grocery store and selling groceries. I thought it might be kind of cool if you told the stories of these small companies. What always fascinated me about small companies was you see on the shelf, side by side, a, a very small company versus you know a major you know manufacturer that has all kinds of advertising budget and all that. And somehow these little guys, you know, not only stay in business, but people sometimes you know sometimes they thrive. People will buy their stuff. And I, I thought, what if we told the stories of the people behind those brands? So I came up with this concept called Small Brand America. Wrote that. That, that one had a a little bit of success, not much. We're talking probably less than 100 copies. But you know, for me, as, a, as an independent author, at least someone was buying my book. So I wrote a follow-up to that, Small Brand America 2. Not quite the success of that one. So again, I'm still kind of spinning my wheels at this point. And then on the third one, I did. Uh, I wrote a book called Small Brand America 3, Special Hawaii Edition. And this is one of the first changing points in what I was doing. What, what happened with that book was, I wrote about all companies that were based in Hawaii that sold grocery products. So it, was, it, it fell in line with everything else I was doing. But what, what ended up happening was many of these small food manufacturers in Hawaii, because it's a very touristy area, will also have shops where they sell to tourists. They sell their products. So one of the cool things was in their gift shops, they started carrying my books. So I literally sold more books through the gift shops that I was selling through Amazon or bookstores and that type of thing. And so that ended up being pretty good. A lot of them also had contacts because uh, they would write about their companies in the local newspaper, so they knew the people to contact. So I contact them and say, "Hey, I know you know this person at this company. Are you interested in talking to me about this new book that I've got the features of?" It, I ended up having all kinds of you know newspaper articles and things like that in Hawaii. All the islands had covered it and things like that. So ended up you know for for me again a small independent author who had published a lot already with literally almost no success. It, it kind of you know put on a, a you know a, turned on a little bit of light and, and, and helped out a little bit. Um, the next one I did, I thought I wanted to follow suit with it. How can I how can I get into gift shops? So I did Small Brand America four, but I just focused on breweries. So again, small breweries that uh, that have to compete against companies like Anheuser Busch or Miller or Coors, and you know and, and told the stories of the people behind those brands. Same thing, they carried it in their gift shops. Ended up being you know a great thing for me. As it came down to the next one, one of the things that I always wanted to write about, because I thought the best thing that you can do if you're a writer is write about what you know. I was a fan of bourbon, and I decided the next one I'll focus on craft is, you know, uh, distillers, the ones that specifically made bourbon. And lo and behold, that book didn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> so you think that that's going to be the turning point? This guy's got all the fun. It didn't, uh, you know, but uh, looking to, to that in a second, how it kind of turned around, it did help out a lot. But I was also writing some short stories, too. Uh, this was an idea that I came up with, was maybe short stories is the, is the ticket. You may just write a story, it's 99 cents, and, and you know, it's, you can read it in half an hour or something like that. And the first one that I did was The Legend of Bear Island. Same thing. One of the most, the things that I'm most proud of is the fact that that story that I had when I was a kid, I have the full story out there. So I have the story of the two boys, when they get to the island, what they go through and all that. So I, I don't know, there's many moments that, that end up, you know, really being beacons of hope when you're doing something like this. And that was that was certainly one of them. But, uh, you know, I had a bunch of other ones, The Killer of Kilauea, again, a story about Hawaii, because I had a little bit of a following in Hawaii, I've been in the newspaper so much. Uh, I did one about my town uh, called uh, The Donut Shop Killer, about a, a donut shop in Oakville, Missouri, which is where I live. And then I wrote one called The Vampire of Cliff Cave, also a, a, a thing in, in then I wrote one called The Lincoln Stalker, which kind of incorporated a little bit of uh, history into it, but also you know, fiction as well. So it kind of blurred the lines a little bit. There was an assassination attempt on uh, President Lincoln, not the time that he got killed by John Wilkes Booth, but there was another time that he got shot at. And uh, I, I kind of blend that story into, into this particular story. But what happened with uh, Small Brain America 5, which ended up being the, the, really the true turning point 
That book didn't sell. A couple of them gift shop, but that's about it. Not, not even a big presence there. Uh, the stories didn't buy as many as the, the places in Hawaii did or the, uh, the breweries. But I did a companion book. I noticed when I was researching all the companies that were in the book, many of them had cocktail recipes featuring their products on them. So I thought, as I'm talking with these people, I said, hey, you've got cocktail recipes. Do you mind if I put them into a book? And I'll do a companion book. My idea was just to grab a little bit of extra money. If they're buying a $12 book or whatever it costs, if they could pick up another book for seven bucks, you know, puts it right at $20. I thought, you know, maybe it's a, it's a way to, uh, you know, further expand that. So I, I didn't think it was going to be any sort of hit, but it ended up being a much better seller than the small brand American book. People bought the cocktail book. So then I got to thinking, well, maybe that should be my focus. Maybe I should focus, what can I do to come up with an idea for a cool cocktail book? Again, I'm not a bartender or a mixologist. I don't know these things. But I do like to talk to people. How can I, what, what concept could I come up with? So what I ultimately came up with was, what if I called 50 iconic bars that are known for bourbon cocktails and said, would you mind sharing your signature cocktail with me? And I could put that in the book. It helps you, it markets your company, your, 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 uh, your brand, because people are, would be interested in coming and seeing your place. And uh, you know, I put it in the book. So there's no sort of uh, deal between us or anything. I don't pay you for that, but you don't pay me for you know advertising your business. And I got 50 bars to do that. And some of the most well-known big bars were very willing to share that. So I put that book out. That came out in uh, early fall of 2015. And um, when I noticed what was different about all my other books, it started selling right away. I put it out the next day, it started selling. People started buying it. <laughs> and it was weird. And about the same time, I joined Instagram. I had been big on Twitter. That's where I had done all my social media marketing to that point. But somebody told me that Instagram is a little bit better for what I'm trying to do. So I joined Instagram, and what I found out there, there was this great bourbon community. People were very supportive and that type of thing. So what I did is I started you know, posting about what I'm looking at, and they again, that, those groups started buying the book. So you know, by, by <coughs> uh, the fall of that year, it ended up outselling the rest of my entire catalog for the combined three years before that. I sold more in just September to December of that one book that I had sold with all the other books combined for the three years I had been doing prior to that. So I thought, wow, now I'm really on to something here. Bourbon is definitely my thing. It's, it's a passion. I love bourbon. I love the everything about it. I love the history. It's so tied into American history. I like the fact that uh, you know the people are very accessible. If you, you know, if you have a favorite distillery and you want to meet the master distiller there, you just go there and you ask for the person. If that person's working that day, they'll come down and meet you, talk to you, tell you what they do, show you around. It's something very different than if you're interested in sports or something like that. And you know, good luck trying to you know, get a hold of a you know, sports uh, person or anything like that. So I thought, this is something that I, that I really want to get more involved with. And I want to continue to write books. So books was going to be my primary passion at that point. But I wanted to expand upon that. So I came up with this idea. What if I did a newsletter? I have so many friends now from Instagram, and a lot of them either want to write, they do blogs, they, they want to expand what they're doing. Um, you know, what if I, I came up with the idea of a newsletter, uh, you know, and util utilize a service that we use, MailChimp is what we use, so it doesn't cost anything if you have under 2,000 subscribers. And, uh, you know, I, I started reaching out to all my friends on Instagram and said, hey, I'm starting this new thing. It's going to be an email magazine, if you will. And, you know, would you like to write for it? I've got, like I said, at this point, over 20 writers for that publication. We started out doing just once a month, but we've gone to twice a month. We've got so much content. And what I did to promote that was, on the 1st of January, 2016, I said, <coughs> coming soon, bourbon seven. And I, I, I've got a graphic artist friend, drew this cool bottle uh, attached to a balloon, you know, and uh, people just like the name and they like the concept. And again, they don't, the name, I think, is kind of genius a little bit because it sticks with people. Uh, and why I picked it was, of course, I like bourbon. And the Zeppelin, I thought, fit for a couple reasons. Number one, it had that kind of rock and roll feel because I like Led Zeppelin, so it kind of fit in well with that. And then the second thing, Zeppelins, of course, are used to advertise and promote businesses. So you think about, you know, the Goodyear Tire uh, Zeppelin, that type of thing. So, so uh, you know, I thought, I'm trying to promote the bourbon industry. I'll call it, you know, Bourbon Zeppelin. And it, that name just stuck with people. Each month on the 1st, because that's when I was going to publish the newsletter starting on June 1st, 
I just put out, you know, coming soon, bourbon's up. And then I'd say, uh, you know, the email, you know, the, the magazine all about bourbon. I just give a little hint, uh, you know, each time about what, what I'm getting ready to do on the first. And then got my, my, my staff writers together. We create all original content. And on June 1st, 2016, we published our first edition. Um, ended up being wildly popular. The, the people like it. Who else likes it is the distillers. So I just looked at, um, I just put this together actually this week in preparation for this. I said, how many different distilleries have their PR person working with me to get their stuff in Bourbon Zeppelin? And I counted 51. I, I, and, and all the big ones from Jim Beam, Four Roses, on down, all the big players you know, participate in that particular publication. If they've got something that's exciting going on, they want to get out in the hands of Bourbon fans, they'll get with me and say, hey, can you run this? And I always do because I like you know, being in good with those folks. And you know, it's it's ends up being uh, you know a pretty cool thing. But the offshoot of that was I, I did an interview uh, as that launched on June 1st, 2016. Again, a friend from Instagram had a blog, and he interviewed me about you know Bourbon Zeppelin and what the future held. And when he asked me what the future was, I said, well, the next thing that I'd like to do, and I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I want to do it is I want to do I want to get into podcasting. And uh, you know, I thought you know, just a show about bourbon is exactly what I'm interested in. And uh, you know, that article ran on the blog. Didn't think anything about it, but somebody reached out to me from Instagram. Somebody that I had known up there, I connected, but I hadn't had, had never talked to this person before. Uh, but he reached out to me and said, "Hey, I don't podcast anymore, but I used to about five years ago. Are you, you know, would you be interested in partnering up? And maybe, maybe we can make this a little bit bigger. Maybe we can do a network with multiple shows." And I thought about it for a while, and ultimately I said yes. Uh, and the two of us started working together, we, and then we got a third person. And then the first show that we did was called The Bourbon Show. So that show literally had, now we didn't have really any contacts or anything like that, but I had written that book, Small Brand American Five, so I knew a lot of craft distillers. So we ended up featuring uh, Christine Radelman, owns a uh, company called Silverback Distillery out of Afton, Virginia. Great company, nice small craft distillery, she's a lot of fun. And uh, she came on and did a great interview for us. Really had a good time. Uh, but again, not necessarily a big Rolodex of context, but where I got lucky was at Gamblin's Whiskey House, uh, which is a restaurant slash bar in St. Louis. It's one of the top bourbon bars in the country. If you look at any list that has the top 25, Gamblin is going to be in there. They're in the central west end part of St. Louis. But they had an event there where they had a guy named Trey Zoller there. And he owns Jefferson's Bourbon. So if, I, if you guys have ever heard of Jefferson's, he owns that one. He was the, the speaker there. So I went up and approached him after the event and said, hey, you know, we're, we've started this podcast. We've done uh, one episode. We've got uh, a lady by the name of Christine Ringelman on there. Could I get you on there? And he said, absolutely. Give me his card. And uh, we ended up booking him. And what happened after that was because he's well respected in the industry, almost all the other bourbon people know him. It was real easy to get guests on after that because they're always worried if they don't know who you are, what's your show going to be like. They don't have time to go listen. And of course, we didn't have a whole lot of shows out there anyway at that point. We're new. Um, but once you have somebody like that on, people will say yes. So, so I got really lucky in that uh, I got the chance to meet Trey, who's since become a, a really good friend. So Trey and I are, are good buddies now. But uh, it all started with that dinner and then getting him on the show. And that, that show really took off. And at that point, we became uh, the number fourth biggest bourbon podcast, and that's a position that we still have today. So we're, we're number four uh, out there, which uh, I don't know if you guys think that's good or bad, but it's, it's pretty good. Number five is the Bourbon Daily. And if you combine those two together, the power of those two together, we're probably the biggest, we're certainly the biggest bourbon-focused podcasting company out there for sure. So, you know, that that ended up, uh, you know, going really well. And uh, that holiday season then, so that was, you know, September 1st, so 2016, I came out with uh, another bourbon mixology book. This time I focused on bars, giving me coffee and holiday uh, cocktail recipes. That one surprisingly didn't do that well. But what happened was, if you remember, I talked about how Bourbon Mixology Volume 2, my 50 iconic bars book, uh, did so well the previous year and I outsold my entire catalog at that point. Well, it ended up blowing up, going through the roof. I, I sold over $5,000 worth of that single book from Black Friday to the week before Christmas which is just amazing for a small independent author to be able to sell that sort of volume uh, on, on that book. So it ended up just going you know, kind of crazy for me. And it, it ends up being the gift that keeps on giving. That book literally will sell on its worst month, 100 bucks, you know, on the slow time of the year, February, March. 
but uh, you know when it gets around to Mother's Day, Father's Day, it spikes up. You know, bike to five hundred dollars, and then uh, come Christmas, it's already picking up. You know, big again this year. So, it uh, if, if you get a winner like that, it, it can really be uh, you know a good thing for you. But as we started uh, becoming more popular with the podcast, I wanted to do more with that. Now, unfortunately, my, my partner Seth Brown, a buddy of mine. Who, uh, who had initially pitched me on the idea, he didn't want to do it anymore. Matter of fact, it started to become too much for him. He had uh, two kids, two young kids. Uh, you know, he just wanted to do it for fun, so he ended up packing up the business. And uh, it ended up being me and then the other guy that we had brought in, a guy by the name of Evan Haskin. And, and you know, at that point, we started to get some sponsors. People started to say, you know, your show is popular, we'd like to you know, sponsor you, so we brought on a couple sponsors. We added a second show, that's when we added the Bourbon Daily. Our idea was to do it Monday through Friday, some Saturday, or some Saturdays if we if we had time, and maybe even some Sundays as well. And that show ended up, you know, really striking a chord with people because it became part of their routine. You know, one of the great things about podcasts is versus other forms of media is, and how many people listen to podcasts in this room? Just a couple, not a huge amount. But one of the good things about podcasts, those of you that did raise your hand there, it's very different than other forms of media. TV shows sometimes will come in and out of or you put in the background, you know, noise while you're gone. With a podcast, the studies have shown that people are pretty singularly focused on them. So they, you know, maybe it's on their morning commute or when they're working out. They, they tend to listen not only to the podcast, but they end up listening to the whole thing. So that ends up being a pretty good advertising medium for many advertisers. So um, when we started the Bourbon Daily, we took on some more sponsors then. So at that point, uh, we were just kind of uh, a couple of guys doing our own thing. Uh, we decided to form a company. So we got uh, an LLC and became the ABD Network LLC. And um, you know, then you know things started to really pick up, and it was looking good. And I ultimately I put together a little plan because the business was growing. It was growing month over month. At that point, I had podcasts. I had uh, you know, bourbon books that were doing really well. And then I had Bourbon Zeppelin, which wasn't really a money generator, but it did get our name out there a lot. About 2,000 readers per month, and uh, you know, 2,000 of the readers, I always like to say. So, because the distillers were so happy, so I really started to put together a plan, and I said, you know, because at this point I'm still working at Unibrew. I'm still a product manager, I'm doing all those things, I'm training, I've got all these things that I'm working on, and I, I, you know, I said, you know, if I can do this for two more years, my daughter uh, was still in school, you know, at that time, but when she graduates, at that point, uh, shortly thereafter, our house will be paid off. So, you know, we're going to be in really good shape where I can quit the job and then just focus solely on the podcast. Well, major curveball happened in July of this year. Uh, they called in the office and said, hey, we're downsizing, times are tough. And they had been doing a lot of layoffs and things like that. A lot of people were getting laid off, but they didn't do it all at once because they don't like to make the newspaper. That's a little corporate thing that they like to do. If they lay off 50 people or 60 people, it makes the newspaper the next day, and they look bad, they don't like that. So what they do is lay off one or two, take a week and lay off. So you know, your friends are getting picked off one by one, and you're like, is it gonna be me? Well, sure enough, in July 20th of, or something, or 21st of 2017, it was me. 